again I say part one, part two, and now part three, really is foundational and is preparation for the next four sessions, which is really to equip you guys for the work of the ministry relative to the divine expression in relation to the prophetic expression, whether it's in the realm of the spirit of prophecy, which is the testament of the Lord Jesus Christ, Revelation chapter 19, verse 10 in the B part, whether it's the gift of prophecy, which is for excitation, edification, and comfort, or the office of the prophet. Now, we've covered that pretty much in depth, and I hope you haven't missed part one, past two. You need to seriously go through it. It's very powerful. Now, tonight I want to talk about us all, including yourselves, on how, and this is, this is key, this is a major key, on how you and I are able, we must enable ourselves to be positioned. This is important. To be positioned in our spirits by putting to death the lusts of the flesh by the Holy Spirit, but we have to position ourselves or if you will get ourselves compatible in the spirit, compatible to be able to hear God's voice. I'm not talking about reading the Logos, the Bible, which is very good. The, I taught you on the Logos and the Rhema, which is the Greek words, two words for our one English or Afrikaans word, French word for love. Or Creole, mi emu, or French, je t'aime, or Afrikaans, lif, yo, lifter, lif, love, English, love. Uh, but I suppose Zulu minatanda when, you know, but in the Greek language, you got logos and rhemes. Now, the logos, sorry, I was talking about love there. I was actually, I should be talking about word, word, word. Well, anyway, love you all. But the fact of the matter is, love in the English language, sorry, word, word in the, I'm, I'm thinking about love now, I, I just feel this overwhelming love uh, just getting a hold of my entire being. It's, it's very interesting because God is love. And that's also just by the way, just let me just say this, seeing as love is just moving into the atmosphere, God is love. One of the first things I was taught uh, relative to the principles governing the prophetic was never, ever, ever prophesy over anybody unless you love people. Even this afternoon when I was praying for you guys and praying, in fact, I spent most of my time thanking God and just speaking to him about all the good things he's done doing and yet to do. But I asked him, I always ask him, almost 30 years later, I ask him for more love more love. According to Romans chapter 5, verse 5, the Holy Spirit sheds His love abroad in our hearts one for another. Therefore, I want the Holy Spirit's love to be shed abroad in my heart in greater measure because therein lies perhaps the foundation of everything is love. And the Holy Spirit can give you that love. But now, we have to position ourselves to become compatible to access or to be positioned for the utterances of God, the rhema word of God. Now, the Logos word of God, which is the Bible, you can read the Bible, that's good, the Logos word of God, heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away, that's Logos. But the rhema word of God is really the utterance of God or the, the prophetic expression. Now, in order to position yourself or to enable yourself by your spirit to be compatible to access that utterance or rhema, 
or God's speech, if you will, if he talks to you, covenant touched very briefly, God obviously can speak to you primarily, number one, through the Bible. Of course, read your Bible. As a prophet, I must study the prophetic scriptures. And remember, no vision, we've already touched on this, but no vision, no revelation, no illumination can violate the truth of God's word. So any encounter or any spiritual experience or any form of inspiration, I use that word specifically inspiration because I don't like to use the word motivation. I actually preached on that word once. It's very scary in the Bible. We are not motivated. We are inspired people. There's a big difference. And we are inspired by the utterance that the Holy Spirit gives us by the power of the Spirit. This is crucial to understand. But anyway, we'll get to that in a later stage. So now remember, God's people became incompatible right there in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve became incompatible to God's speech. They had displaced themselves through their disobedience, through their sinful nature uh, by committing sin now inheriting a sinful nature, uh, and as a result, they hid themselves, and God had to look for them, not because he couldn't find them or know where they were, obviously, in the flesh, but because the glory of God departed. He couldn't see himself. He couldn't see his image in the earth. Uh, so uh, they were naked, uh, and we know the whole story, Adam being the first prophet, really. But the fact of the matter is, right from that point in time, we really began to rely more on the knowledge of good and evil, which we eat from such tree. Uh, okay, now that gives us 2020 vision, which we were never supposed to operate under. And the more you draw closer to God, the more inspiration you're able to attain, the more utterance of the Holy Spirit you're able to get, whether it's through the Word of God, that becomes rhema by the Spirit, whether it's through inspired preaching by the Holy Spirit, not dead talking, blah, 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 like certain people, um, but inspired preaching, God can speak to you like that, of course, so we say through the Bible, inspired preaching, prophecy, nature, my goodness, he even used a donkey if he asked it like he spoke to the madness of the prophet by the donkey. Amen. But the fact of the matter is, you have got to position yourself. You have got to set yourself up to become compatible to God's speech. Now, here is the key. Here is the key to positioning yourself to being compatible to inspiration, rhema, word, utterance, and placing yourself in what we call the zone of revelation. The zone of revelation. Or positioning yourself to tap into the mysteries of God. The word mysteries of God, Paul uses the word often. And remember, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. The word mysteries of God, the word mysteries is the Greek word mysterion, which means the secrets of God. <coughs> Excuse me the secrets of God, the plans of God, the purposes of God. Now, when you position yourself to move into that realm of inspiration by the Holy Spirit, to receive utterance and to become an utterance and move into that realm of what we call the zone of revelation, that you might speak the mysteries, the secrets, the plans, the purposes of God, uh, not only to yourself, and I'll get into that a bit later, but also to others. And you reveal the secrets of their hearts, 
In other words, God's mysteries, God's plans, God's purposes for them, they will always fall down on their faces. I've seen it over and over around the world, fall on their faces, fall down their knees, and acknowledge that God is in your midst. And God is with you. Here's the key. <laughs> and I know maybe some people have taught you otherwise. Uh, maybe uh, you don't believe in it. I don't know, but here's the key. After almost 30 years of operating in the ministry and the mysteries of God, here's the key. Praying in the Spirit. Praying in other tongues. Of course, praying with the understanding, but primarily, the more you pray in the Spirit, the more you position yourself and the more you are able to enable your spirit to be compatible with God's speech. Now, when I say praying in the spirit, I'm not saying praying in the English language. When I pray in English, I speak English. If you should pray in French, you'll speak French. If you should pray in Afrikaans, you'll speak Afrikaans. If you should pray in Zulu or Sutu or Kosa, uh, you'll pray in Zulu, Sutu, Kosa. But when, you know, I, I've met many people over the years say, well, I pray in the Spirit, and the way I pray in the Spirit is I, I, I pray in Afrikaans, or I pray in English, I'm praying in the Spirit. No, you're not. You could eventually get there where you speak and it's so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that it is your breath literally becomes filled with the fire of God. Your breath becomes spirit. I understand that, but to get to that place, you're going to have to spend time in praying in the Spirit. So, if you want to be effective in enabling yourself and positioning yourself and getting yourself in the spirit compatible to God's speech or to hearing his voice. The key is praying in other tongues. When I pray in the spirit, I speak spirit. For example, now this is not the gift of tongues, which requires interpretation. I'm just going to pray in the spirit. And if you pray in the spirit, just pray in the spirit right now with me. when I pray with the understanding, I'm very limited. My vocabulary in the understanding is, my goodness, I remember I'm in America and I'm busy uh, speaking to the guys about praying, you know, at least one hour. Pray one hour, Jesus said, lest you enter into temptation. If you just want to deal with temptation, one hour of prayer, according to Jesus the Christ, is essential. That's to deal with temptation. When you get into the second hour of prayer, mm, you start moving mm, beyond the flesh. Usually, yeah, by the end of the second hour, after all these years, but in the beginning, it used to be yeah, around about the third, fourth hour. And you say, well, when am I supposed to pray? Get up early in the morning. Or, if you're, uh, that's if you like, go to bed early. Work your time. It's 24 hours. Work your times. You know, I started off my Christian walk. My pastor got me to pray with him every morning. I didn't have a job, so I could do it then. Every morning from 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock. It was four hours of prayer every day for two years. That's how I learned to pray. And remember, the only time Jesus was ever asked any question primarily about spiritual matters, if you will, was when Jesus' disciples asked him, Lord, 
teach us how to pray. The only time they ever, excuse me, let me rephrase that. The only time Jesus' disciples ever asked him to teach them anything was when they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Because Jesus, the Son of Man, who's also the Son of God, who's also Jesus, the Christ, God come in the flesh, prayed a lot. And if Jesus, while he walked the earth, had to pray a lot, separate himself early hours of the morning before daybreak, before the sun would rise. How much more you and I, I'm telling you, therein lies a major key to the prophetic. Now, over the years, I've heard just about every kind of argument against prayer. I'm sure there are some guys that have been praying for 30 years. Now they don't really need to pray all that much. They just pray five minutes. I've met guys like that. But they don't tell you how much they used to pray to get to that place and how many years it took them to get to that place. Because it's kind of like now they're so saturated with the anointing. It's like, like with Eli Elisha, the anointing even saturated them into his bones that when a dead man was thrown into his tomb, the anointing was so strong in his bones that that anointing, that power of God raised him from the dead. How's that for anointing? Now, let's get to this subject, this issue of praying in the Spirit. Because as a prophet, I can tell you something right now. If I'm going to prophesy, and if I'm going to prophesy by the Spirit, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, by the breath of God, by the utterances of the Spirit, by becoming an oracle of God by asking him to fill my mouth with his words that I may prophesy above all else. Then, my friend, I need to spend time with God. I really need to spend time with God. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you right now is if you want to move into the realm of revelation, illumination, so that you can move into divine inspiration or expression, you need to pray in other tongues. So now let's just get to a scripture for that. And of course, the Word of God. It's, I'm not detracted from the Word of God, but let me tell you something. You can read the Word of God till you blew in the face. It doesn't make any sense to you. One of the ways you'll begin to tap into the Word of God and get understanding is by spending time with God because God is not going to... That book was authored by the Holy Spirit. You know, I remember a man, a great guy, a dear friend of mine, so if, he, if he's watching or he hears about this, I'm not in any way belittling him. But this man was an engineer, and he was the head engineer over the engineers that built the space shuttle. So this guy was so intelligent, and I mean an academic of note, that literally he flew men to the moon. He built the vehicle, the space shuttle, that would fly men into outer space to the moon, if you will. I would say it's a clever guy. Now, for some unknown reason, he took to me. Don't ask me why, because I'm, I'm not in that league at all. I must admit, though, when I'm under the, the power of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I can have a conversation with anybody. Even I'm shocked at what comes out of my mouth. I, have a prof I mean, I was given a degree, a doctorate, not a lucky packet doctorate. I was given a doctorate by professors in the United States of America. They only give four a year. And it is actually considered the highest degree, doctorate degree. <laughs> I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just telling you. Now you know I'm also a doctor. But anyway, a doctorate degree. And there's only four that that university gives out a year. And uh, I was busy preaching in a church in the United States of America. I didn't know these professors were sitting there. And I began to preach in Greek. And I've never studied Greek. I've never even been to university. And they were so impressed by my knowledge of the Word of God in Greek that these professors were blown away and nominated me for a doctorate, which they then had approved. And it's not just 
a lucky packet doctorate. It's actually what is known as an earned degree. In other words, many university students get a doctorate at the end of their studies in anticipation of what they yet to do at a doctorate level. My doctorate was given to me in recognition of what I've done at doctorate level. And it comes with a letter as an earned degree, not just a lucky packet thing. So I'm telling you that because this guy flies me into the moon and for some other reason took to me and began to come to my meetings. And he, he, he would come to my meetings, he came for about six months. And eventually he phoned me and invited me to his house. Uh, he's got houses all over the world, but this one house was in South Africa in Bedford View. And he invited me out there and uh, I got to his house and uh, went and sat in his lounge and uh, just had a little bit of social interaction, a bit of chit chat. And, and, and then he, he, he stood up and, and, and he was pacing the room, just, just pacing the room and, and so frustrated. And he said these words to me, Mark, I don't get it. I just don't get it. I said, what don't you get? He said, I've been following you around, going to all your meetings. And those times I did meetings every week from Sunday to Thursday, sometimes the whole week, sometimes two weeks at one church at a time. As a revivalist back in the day, he says, I don't get it. I said, what don't you get? He says, I don't get the Bible. I don't get the resurrection factor. I don't understand it. I've read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. I've read that book over and over and over and over again. And I don't understand anything. And I thought to myself, this is amazing. I didn't say it to him. I, I just thought, wow. You know, here's a guy that can fly people to the moon, but the Bible makes no sense to him. And God uses the foolish things of, the, of this world to confound the wise. I mean, just one book that God puts together completely confounds highly academic, highly intelligent people. They, they just don't get it. Yeah, we are, you and I, or me. And please, I'm not against academics. If, if you're an academic watching right now, I have the highest regard for you. I have a lot of academic friends. Uh, I have a lot of people that are highly intelligent, have university degrees of note from doctors to lawyers to, to guys that run some of the biggest companies in this nation. And, and they, they've all got doctorates. And, they, and so I'm not against academia and academics. But I'm not one of them. I, I, I'm like from the streets. I'm from the gutters. But I'm thinking to myself, this guy, such a great academic, flies me to the moon, doesn't get the Bible. And he just can't understand it. And I was amazed by this. And then suddenly I heard the Holy Spirit begin to whisper in my ear and tell me a few things. And so I looked at him and I said, let's just call him Mr. B. I said, Mr. B, I said, you will never understand that book. He said, why? He said, I read stuff, I do this, I do that. And, and like I said, he flies people to the moon. I said, you will never understand that book until you get the author of that book in your life. And the author of that book is the Holy Spirit. And unless you get saved, give your life to Jesus Christ and receive the gift that was promised by the Father to Abraham, of course, our father in the faith, the Holy Spirit, you'll never get it. You, you might be able to get an academic understanding just like Satan. He can quote the scripture too. He, he knows the Bible. Trust me, the devil knows the Bible. He knows the word. He knows the word very intimately. He, he, he used to be friends with the word. He used to have access as Lucifer, the archangel, to the inner workings. Uh, if you studied the scripture in the Hebrew language, into the inner circle. He had access into the very chamber of God, another translation says out of the Hebrew where he would converse with God. He still does it, actually. He even accuses us day and night. He goes to the Father from time to time, often roaming to and fro across the earth, seeking those whom he may devour. Then he goes to God and he begins to accuse, as the accuse of the brethren, sometimes day and night. Then he comes back down and looks around for a couple of guys, and then he goes back to God. So he's very intimate with the word. But how many of you know that word carries absolutely no? He can quote the scripture. Satan can quote the scripture, and he did to Jesus. But it had no impact, no power. And yet when Jesus quoted the scripture, let me tell you something. Sometimes he would just say one word and people fall down. But anyway, okay. So my point is this, that unless you have the Holy Spirit, and, 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 and here's the key. The more I began to pray in the Spirit and then read the Word, 
the more God began to open the word to me. Like now, almost 30 years later, do you know that, that, that all the material I'm going to share with you in this third session, I made a few notes, my team had come and took me 10 minutes. But I, I, I could talk forever because now after all these years, when I read the Bible, I can just read a ch chapter and, and I, I get an instant revelation and almost instant illumination. And I can almost instantly take a scripture and I can preach. Now, I couldn't do that in the beginning. Just to put a sermon together would take me six months of hard labor, sweat, blood, tears, praying eight hours a day, crying, kicking, screaming, lying on the floor, hammering the floor because it was just so difficult to put a sermon together. Now I can just pray. God tells me what he wants me to preach to the people. I'm talking about inspired preaching. I'm not teaching. Teaching is a different story. But inspired preaching. And uh, he'll tell me something, just sometimes just a word. And then I go to the scripture, get some reference in the scripture to that which God wants to say to the church, hit that platform, begin to preach. I could preach all night if I have to. I have to stop because I'm limited by time because I care for the people. I need the people to get home. It's, it is South Africa. It's pretty dangerous. Um... And so uh, therein lies the key. So let's have a quick look at our first scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 14. And I'm going to read first from number 13 to 18 just to confirm. Uh, the. Uh, and let me tell you something. The one person who doesn't want you to speak in other tongues is Satan. Religious people don't want you to speak in other tongues. But they say, well, you know, the unbeliever will get offended and all that stuff. Let me just tell you something. The Bible says that tongues are a sign for the unbeliever. Paul says tongues are a sign for the unbeliever. It's religious people that get upset about praying in tongues in this word. Now, there's diversities of tongues. We've already talked about tongues that came at Pentecost. There's the gift of tongues, which requires interpretation if it's applied in the church. But then there's your prayer language or even singing in the Spirit, which is another tongue. So let me read a scripture. Paul is talking to the Corinthian church who were ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. He dedicates three chapters to the subject, chapter 12, chapter 13, and chapter 14. Now, there's no ways I can, I'll, I'll need a whole week to teach you just chapter 12, 13, 14, even longer, actually, all month. But if you want to get the gist of what Paul is saying, you have to take it into context, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, because many religious people take scripture out of context, and twisted to their own destruction and the destruction of others. So if you just take a little scripture, yeah, a little scripture there, just like Satan did, you, you, you can say anything and try and convince people. That's why you've, there's got to be uh, the hermeneutics, which is context, pretext, context, and post-text. You've got to put it together to get an idea of what God is saying, otherwise you're going to get confused. Okay. So Paul says, uh, talking about tongues, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue, he's talking about in the church now, pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. Now, here he's specifically talking about the gift of tongues. He then moves over into another realm, which is our natural spiritual language, where we can, outside of the church and even in the church, corporately uh, pray in the spirit, sing in the spirit. But he's talking about the gift of tongues. If, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now he says in verse 15, what is the conclusion then? What is the conclusion? He's coming to the conclusion in chapter 14. He's coming to the conclusion about a whole bunch of stuff. 
that is mentioned in chapter 12 and chapter 13. What is the conclusion then? I will pray. Now he's talking about pray. I will pray with the Spirit. This is in the context of tongues. Right? That's why just now I said, come, let's all pray in tongues. I, Paul says, what is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. For, he says in verse 14, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. Now he's talking about prayer. If I pray in the tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. When he says my understanding is unfruitful, it doesn't mean to say you're not going to have any thoughts. It's just not going to be producing fruit in your life. Uh, eventually, I mean, you don't blank your mind out. Your mind's not blank. There are thoughts that come. But eventually your thoughts, as you're praying in the Spirit, begin to turn towards that which is godly and begin to move into the realm of what we call the mind of Christ, where you become a spiritual man. We can carry on all night just on that. Paul talks about three kinds of men, the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. The natural man is the unregenerate man. The unregenerate man is the unsaved man. He's the natural man. Then you have the carnal man. The carnal man is a Christian who is not in the spirit. We call them unspiritual spirituals, most dangerous people on the planet. They're religious, they're carnal, and they don't have the mind of Christ. Forever taking scripture out of context, twisting it, trying to get people to believe a lot of rubbish. Then you have the spiritual man who has the mind of Christ. Now the spiritual man is a man who prays in the spirit by other tongues. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is fruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. There you have a distinct difference between praying in the Spirit, which is in tongues, and praying with the understanding, which is English, French, Afrikaans, Zulu, Kosa. So don't tell me when I... Uh, praying in English, I'm also praying in the Spirit. No, you're not. When you pray in tongues, or when you sing, So what is the conclusion there? I will pray with the Spirit, which is in other tongues, and I will also pray with the understanding. Now, in my experience, I'm limited with time in praying with my understanding. When I come to God with thanksgiving, I say, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this new day, for example. Thank you that I can uh, awaken the dawn with my praise. Father, that's a great sunrise, my goodness. And I tell him all the great things he is and his artistic and creative expression and just talking about the sunrise and, and I thank him for the food I have to eat and then I thank him for this and I thank him for that and I, 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 I thank him for all kinds of things. So when I'm praying with the understanding, I'm extremely limited in the amount of time that I have. But when I go over to pray in other tongues and I begin to pray in the spirit, uh, I can pray all night. I can pray through the night. I can separate myself from fasting and praying, pray a little bit of the understanding, and then go over and say, okay, Father, now I do not know how I ought to pray as I should for these matters, but however, the Holy Spirit helps me. And when the Holy Spirit helps me, you know, then I pray the will of the Father. I make intercession. And uh, that's just the way it goes. And uh, then he helps me. 
so so this is important so i'm very limited with my understanding so paul says i will pray with the spirit and i will also pray with the understanding notice that he says i will pray the spirit first so he puts emphasis priority on that and i'll pray with the understanding i will excuse me i will sing with the spirit and i will also sing with the understanding so you know a lot of people say, well, you know, when you pray in other tongues, you know, you must just pray privately in your closet and things like that. Listen, they had prayer meetings, corporate prayer meetings in the early church. John and Peter were on their way to a prayer meeting when they raised the guy that was paralyzed. So don't, don't let anyone tell you that you can't have prayer meetings. We have prayer meetings collectively. Uh, we have prayer meetings through the year. In October, we call it Prayer October. Uh, my team has a prayer meeting every single morning. They know how to start their day unless they've prayed one hour. How on the planet Earth are they supposed to operate in the Spirit if they haven't prayed in the Spirit? So they're not allowed to answer a telephone unless they've prayed one hour every day. They go to the office collectively, corporately. They pray with the Spirit. They pray with the understanding. Sometimes they'll even go over to singing in the Spirit, singing understanding. So you can do that individually and you can do that corporately, even in the local church. Now, if someone speaks in another tongue, as in the gift of tongues, it requires interpretation. And if he doesn't have the interpretation, uh, then or is unable to interpret, then he must rather keep quiet. If there's no one to interpret tongues, whereas the gift of the interpretation of tongues, he must just keep quiet. And uh, then if they want to pray in the church, and he's just praying, so let's just say everybody's busy worshiping God. I do it often. I come into the service. I've already spent four hours in prayer. The people are busy worshiping God, but I just want to stay in, 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 in connection with him. I'll just very quietly just pray very quietly in the spirit so nobody can hear me. Don't disturb anybody. But then if everybody begins to go into praying in other tongues or singing in other tongues, then I join in and we can all do that corporately. Okay, I, I know you're getting it. You got it. Okay, so I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. Nowhere does Paul condemn speaking in other tongues in the church. That's a blooming lie from the devil, okay? There you have. He, he says, otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, now let's say, for example, we're sitting giving thanks. If you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupy, occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? So the people that he's concerned about is, is not the sinner or the unsaved, because tongues is a sign for the unsaved. He's talking about Christians who are just uninformed. They're just ignorant. He says, you know, if you come together, say around a table, you want to give thanks, and you're all giving thanks in other tongues and the spirit, the uninformed is not going to get it. Uh, the uninformed is not going to be able to say amen. So how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks since he does not understand what you say? Talking about Christians now, uninformed, ignorant ones. But now watch, he's not forbidding it. He's saying for you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So I'll often say, for example, give thanks with the understanding. Then I say, look, Father, I, I've got so much gratitude in my spirit I'm now going over into the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I ask you to give thanks and praise to my Father because I know, now I'm talking about now in my personal prayer, and even when we do corporate prayer, the very first thing we do is, let's say we're all praying for an hour, like on a Saturday morning prayer meeting, we all come together to the church, and an hour before church services on a Sunday, and we're all praying corporately, we spend 15 minutes just giving thanksgiving. So for about three to five minutes, we'll say thanks for the understanding. And then we all come to agreement. One person prays with the understanding. We're all in agreement with giving thanks. And then we all go over into the spirit because we're not uninformed individuals. And we all give thanks to God for about 10 minutes with the spirit, praying in other tongues. Amen. Why? Because we indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. Who's not edified? The uninformed Christian. So right now, if there's any uninformed people, you're no longer uninformed just in those few minutes, I've got you understanding that nowhere does Paul dissuade anyone from praying in, in other tongues, praying in the Spirit. And all I'm saying to you is if you want to move in the prophetic, 
If you want to move in inspiration, if you want to move in understanding illumination, if you want to get the word of God, if you want to speak as an oracle of God, if you want him to fill your mouth, if you want him to remind you of the word, if you want to be in the spirit, is the key. Pray in the spirit. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. In verse 18, Paul says, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. What a statement. Notice that Paul got so much revelation, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. What was his key? This is important. I'm getting to a point now. It has a lot to do with the prophetic. I thank my God I pray with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in tongues. Doesn't help. I get in the, in the pulpit and for one hour speak in tongues to the congregation. They're not going to have a cooking clue of what I'm saying unless they're really in the spirit. Because if you're really in the spirit, I tell you, you know, I can be with a group of two, three guys and we can spend say, eight hours in prayer. We're in the spirit. We can talk to each other in tongues. It's like, I know what I'm saying in the English language and they know what I'm saying. It's the most incredible experience, but that's another story for another time. So uh, also in chapter number 14, if we just go back a little bit in verse number two, uh, in verse number two, Paul the apostle says, for he who speaks in a tongue, for he who speaks in a tongue, that is in the spirit, does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, that's the key. He speaks mysteries. But my experience, nobody understands him. That is, nobody understands me. While I'm busy praying in the spirit. But my experience tells me one hour, two hours, three hours in the spirit, praying in other tongues. I then begin to understand the mysteries that I'm speaking. It is the most amazing dynamic. Huh. Mysteries. Now, we've got to get to the word mysteries because that is the word for the English language in the, in the Greek, mysterion, which means secrets. Now, God does nothing but that he first reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets, his musterion. But now in the New Testament, as I've taught you, you can all hear God's voice for yourself, and he'll share his mysteries with you. And this is the key to tapping into the mysteries, the secrets, the plans, the purposes of God for your personal life, for your family, and for your church, or for a nation, or for a city. We're talking prophetic now, inspired communication, divine expression praying in other tongues is the key now i spent a little bit of time on that because my goodness people just don't get it i mean even pastors don't get it. you know most pastors in the united states only pray five minutes they say a week i believe it is five minutes a week in prayer no wonder there's no revival no wonder there's no anointing no wonder there's no inspiration no wonder there's no divine expression no wonder there's nothing happening. But you want the key? I just gave it to you. That's the key. All righty then. Now. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now this is very, very important. Now watch. I want to show you how Paul operated. And I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter, I would say, mm, let's try. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Now I'm going to go through this pretty fast because I want to get to some stuff, but I'm, sh I'm, I'm, I'm my point and what I'm trying to say to you is that there's no ways I can talk about revelation, illumination, divine expression, unless you get what I've just shared with you now, the importance of speaking or praying in other tongues. 
or even worshiping in the spirit. Jesus said to the woman at the well, the time is now at hand when the true worshipers will worship him in spirit and in truth. True worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. In other words, not hypocritically to try and impress people or whatever. It has to be in truth from your heart towards God. Now, let me show you a key of how Paul operated. And this is crucial. And then I'm going to move into uh, flowing effectively in the mysteries, what you need and what you'll get if you'll just do what I've taught you now. Praying in the Spirit, in other tongues, is key to the prophetic. Period. Okay. 29 and a half years, January, the 27th of January, 20 past 10, I'll have been doing this for 30 years. I'm telling you now, I'm telling you now, and I'll tell you again, the key is what I just shared with you and labored quite a bit on it for you. I, I could spend a month talking about it. But now, let's, I mean, even at FBN, I heard guys misquote the scriptures that I'm going to share with you now. They just, just don't get it. Now, you're going to have to listen very carefully. So, right now in the presence of God, I'm going to pray a prayer for you. Just very quickly before we get into this. Everybody within the sound of my voice, I pray now. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, I pray that you would grant each one wisdom that comes from above, that you would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, and that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened right now so that they can get what I'm about to share with them now, which is crucial to becoming a divine expression, supernatural inspiration by your breath relative to utterance. Whew. Now, I wish I had more time with you, my goodness, but now just listen carefully. Paul the Apostle had literally been out of the will of God for about 15 years. Now, I've studied Paul's life. I've walked in his footsteps. I tell the, the truth of it. Now, I haven't got time to go into it, but let me just say this to you. Paul was out of the will of God because he had violated the prophetic sequence that was prophesied to him by a disciple, not an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, by a disciple called Ananias. You can read the story in Acts chapter number 9. Now, God comes to Ananias in a vision and talks to him about Paul, gives him the address, a street called Straight, gives him the owner of the house, his name, Jonas, and tells him who's there, Saul of Tarsus, what he's getting up to. He's busy praying. He's blind. And he wants this guy, this disciple, Ananias, to go to him and prophesy to him, telling him what great things he must suffer, yet for his name's sake, God's sake, and prophesy that he will go to the Gentiles, the Jews, and then the satraps, governors, and leaders. But Paul didn't go to the Gentiles initially. He went to the Jew first. And it was only when he walked into the city of Corinth that he met uh, Aquila and Priscilla, who had been banished from Rome, and he met them after he'd been laughed off Mars Hill in Athens. He'd walked 50 miles all alone, had limited success in, he was a great academic, Paul, by the way. He, he'd studied at the University of Tarsus, which was the greatest university of its day. Walks 50 miles from Athens. I'm not too sure what that is in kilometers, but he walks 50 miles from Athens, from Mars Hill. A couple of people got saved. Up to that point in time, he was forever in trouble, always battling. Until he gets to the city of Corinth, a very vile city, a very bad city. The religion was the occult. The industry was prostitution. It was a mess of a city. Paul walks in there all alone. Now, here in chapter number 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, when he's writing the letters to the Corinthian church years later, 
he basically tells them and talks to them about the journey from Mars Hill, Athens to Corinth and how he began to think about things. So it was like after, in fact, after two years, together with Aquila and Priscilla, he was still going to the Jew when eventually he got fed up and said to the religious guys of the Jews, I've had it with you guys. I'm now going to the Gentile world. When he went to the Gentiles, that's when he planted the church in Corinth. That became a very thriving, successful church. And that's from that point on is when he began to have success, when he tapped into the prophetic sequence that had been prophesied to him. And from that point on, finances began to come in. Uh, the guys from the churches would come and bring offerings to him. And he commends them for it and so forth and so on. But now he's writing to them and explaining to them what he decided, what he thought on that 50-mile journey. Here we go. And I, brethren, when I came to you on his way, and when I finally got to you, did not come with excellence of speech <coughs> or of wisdom, Declaring to you the testimony of God or the testimony of Christ. Prior to him operating under inspiration, prior to him operating, even though he had a lot of revelation, I'll get to that just now, his expression was still foolish. I'll prove it to you just now how that happens. But the fact of the matter is he'd made a decision that he was not going to operate with excellence of speech. He was not going to operate out of the wisdom that he had as an academic. For I determined, this is on the journey, to not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In other words, everything that comes with that crucifixion. And it's not just salvation as in which we know salvation, that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that's fantastic. But there's a lot more that comes with salvation. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Inspiration resurrection uh, my goodness is a lot we've just come through the passover there's a lot now he begins to make some confessions that are, are astounding he says i was with you in weakness in fear and in much trembling and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom Something happened to Paul. But in demonstration of two things, of number one, the spirit, demonstration of the spirit, this is crucial to understand, demonstration of the spirit or manifestation of the spirit and of power. There can't be a demonstration of power until there's a demonstration or, if you will, a manifestation of the Spirit. And when you talk about demonstration, it means making manifest in the Greek language. The Greek language is, uh, the way you would pronounce it in English is eikesis, eikesis. Uh, Odykesis, Odykesis, Odykesis in the Greek language. I'm, I'm just saying in the English, uh, Apodyxis is the Greek word, and it's translated as, as making manifest. The word demonstration there means making manifest. So you have to manifest the Spirit first before there would be a manifestation of power. It means a showing forth. A showing forth. So demonstration there means a manifestation first of spirit, then comes power. It means a showing forth or a revealing or a revelation, right? I know you guys are getting it. Listen carefully now because this is very powerful. He says that your faith, your faith, should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now, when we're talking about the power of God, remember we're talking about first the manifestation of or the showing forth of 
the Holy Spirit so that there can be power, which means that the utterance or his communication or his inspiration when he spoke the word had to be not logos, but had to be rhema for them to have faith. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and the word word there in the Greek is the Greek word rhema. Inspiration, utterance of the breath, utterance of the Holy Spirit. That is what builds faith. I know you're getting it now. Listen carefully. I know you're getting it. Now he says, however, now we need to understand however. Word however primarily is translated or should be translated as but now as a result of me no longer using my academic abilities only, the wisdom that I have from my university experiences, I had all this revelation, but now I'm getting it. I, I've been around, it's been a disaster. And now I understand that I, I can't impress man uh, because I've learned a couple of things now. My mistakes basically is what he's saying. But now he says, I've come to the conclusion in the Greek, it says, but now, uh, now at these times, talks about times, uh, I want you to understand that it's, also translation lost translated moreover in additional information i want you to understand that now here's the additional information i want to give you based on what i've just said to you so the word however there means okay i've said this i decided not to minister like i used to minister i wasn't getting results I decided to know him and him crucified. That's not just in his death because then he would, it means, as I've said, much more. Now, as a result, I manifest the spirit and the power, which means I bring forth, which we call demonstration, but it's, it's, it's to bring forth, it's to manifest. Okay, the spirit first and then the power. He says, now, but, however, as in time, this is how we do it. We speak wisdom among those who mature, who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. He's not talking about human beings here. Okay. But only because there's a spiritual expression here. But we speak. Now watch what he says. We speak. We speak. The word speak there is very important. We speak which means to importune someone with speech. It means, in the Greek language, it means the whole, the whole, which is not very common in secular usage. The whole which is not very common in secular usage. In other words, it talks about that which is to calumniate, 
to importune someone with speech. Importune. Dave, you got something you want to add there? Are you okay? All right. So he's basically saying we importune speech. In other words, remember there was a time when Peter, in Acts chapter number 10, we read about how Cornelius had a vision. He wasn't a Jew. He was a proselyte. And in Acts number, chapter number 10, we see how an angel of the Lord comes to him. And the angel of the Lord says, I want you to go to Peter. God also goes to Peter, who's very kind of like prejudiced at that point in time, wants nothing to do with the Gentiles because the, the, the salvation only went to the Gentiles or was taken to them uh, from Acts chapter number 10. Cornelius' household and himself was the first one to read salvation outside of the Jews. Uh, and Peter gets this revelation while he's on the top there, busy fasting and praying. Then he's hungry, orders something to eat and has this powerful vision. And he, like always, argues with the Lord. Uh, and then ultimately, kind of long story short, you can go read it yourself in Acts chapter number 10. Uh, Cornelius goes to Peter, or so rather, excuse me, Peter goes to Cornelius' house and to his friends and family. And, that, and while Peter is still speaking to him, the power of the Holy Spirit falls. Speech if you're in the spirit, like I've shared with you, and you open your mouth to speak, there's a manifestation of the spirit. And in that manifestation of the spirit, there is the potential, even as I'm speaking to you, for power to begin to take place. For example, heaviness to lift off you. You can even be healed while I'm busy speaking because now there comes a manifestation of power. But it comes first by speech which manifests the Holy Spirit. Whew. Very important. Which I, I, I need a month on this, but okay. I know you're getting it. However, we speak wisdom amongst those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing, but we speak, we manifest the wisdom of God the wisdom of God in a mystery. Ah, we speak, we manifest, we make known, demonstrate the wisdom of God in a mystery. So what Paul is saying now, if you study it, the commentators that know will tell you that the way, just like I've been explaining to you, the way that Paul was able to manifest the spirit that would produce power was by praying in other tongues. For he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto man, but unto God. Howbeit in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. For those in Afrikaans, uh, uh, it's a beautiful word in Afrikaans, die verborgen hede van God. Die verborgen hede van God. The mysteries of God, which is the secrets of God, Mysterion, the secrets of God, the plans of God, the purposes of God, the will of God. So in other words, Paul says, I thank my God that I pray in tongues more than you all. That's where he got his revelation from. So he prays and prays and prays in the Spirit, prays and prays and prays in tongues, and then begins to have his mind move from being unfruitful in his understanding to the mind of Christ that when he opens his mouth to speak, the manifest presence of God is there. People are even baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit. My, I can tell you many stories where I've got up on a platform, begin to open my mouth to speak, and people by their hundreds fall down just as I'm talking. Jesus just opened his mouth to speak and the, the people fell down. When, 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 when the, 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 the religious leaders and the Roman soldiers and Judas came to fetch him and Judas came to betray him, he opened his mouth and he said, I am. And as he spoke, there was a manifestation of spirit. Power was released and the people in the flesh, couldn't even stand. They all fell down. One, one phrase, I am. 
manifest the spirit, wisdom of God, obviously, power is there. I was in FBN recently, and I love FBN, and I love Andre Ray, but I think he's a special man. A lot of people don't like him, maybe not your style, but I've sat with him personally, and even my team just got to fall in love with him in a very special way. 20 to 1 last night, we were communicating. A.M. But I, I watched the whole week as the guys were talking about the power and preaching about the power and so forth. And I, I, I was a little bit disappointed because they were talking about miracles and signs and wonders. And I just said to the Lord, Lord, you know what? I, I'm a little bit embarrassed and, and I'm sure you're embarrassed. I'm going to get up there now. I want you to do some miracles. That was on the Sunday. I got up there and out of all the speakers that were there visibly on live television, we had, what, really about seven miracles? When I talk about miracles, I'm not talking about healings. I'm talking about visible miracles, people that were, say, paralyzed in their arms. Uh, I particularly call for shoulder conditions where people have been stabbed, car accidents, they couldn't use their arms, and one after the other. God usually always, always one not because to keep me humble. But anyway, that's another story for another time. But I'm just saying. You open your mouth, you've been, you're praying in the Spirit, which is the speaking the mysteries of God. Paul would get that, then he would come and speak the wisdom. There'd be a manifestation of the Spirit, and then power. <clears throat> and obviously, speaking by the Spirit of prophecy, which is the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the people don't get. I tell you, we'll get into that when we get to, to spiritual perception. But for now, I need to get to where I'm trying to go. And my goodness, we kind of like haven't even started. My students, you guys are still there, right? You're still listening. I, I know. I know. I can feel it. Now it's getting hot. Now listen. And I'm going to say it again slowly. You've got to listen. And you've got to go through these messages again. You, you've got to take notes. You've got to go through it again. That's why we're going to, we're going to organize uh, uh, copies of these sessions. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, Mysterion, in a secret that's praying in other time, tongues. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. God hasn't just got a glory. We've also got a glory. Satan's even got a glory. When he said to Jesus, I'll, I'll, I'll give you all these worlds and my glory in it. He's talking about his glory. The word glory is doxa. It speaks about a reputation, speaks about the nature, the character, the essence of who you are, especially in Christ. But everyone has a glory. The glory of a man is his wife. Uh, but we've all got a glory. We've all got a reputation. We've all got an expression. And it should be a divine expression. So he says, what I spoke, what I manifest, by praying in other tongues, because the only way you can do it in a mystery is by speaking in the Spirit in other tongues. It was hidden, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, for the essence of who we should be, or what should take place in our lives. Like, why the blind man, but for the glory of God. So if we were really doing our job a lot of the blind would see for the glory of God. A lot of the lame would walk for the glory of God. But we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. We never pray in the Spirit. We never manifest the Spirit. So there's never any real power. Now, which God ordained, we take note of this, before the ages for our glory. So there was a mystery, a secret, a purpose, a plan, a will of God for your life before the foundations of the earth that had to be revealed to you for your glory, which Paul said he did by speaking the wisdom of God in the mystery. And all the commentators will say it's because he was praying in other tongues. That's where he got it. And then, bam, he tapped into revelation, illumination. Then he went out, spoke, bam. Okay, you're getting it, right? Watch what he says. 
which none of the rulers of this age knew. None of the rulers of this age knew. None of the rulers of this age knew what? Students, my warriors, none of the rulers of this age knew that by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, you could receive the power of the Holy Spirit, you could pray in other tongues, you could then manifest the Spirit, the power of God would be made manifest, people's lives would be touched for His glory and for our glory, their glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew that I would come and manifest the Spirit and manifest the power by praying in other tongues, speaking the wisdom of God in a mystery. The Spirit of the Lord says, I paid a price with my very blood. Yes, my child, I died on a tree that you might be healed, that you might be saved, and that you might receive my Holy Spirit. <coughs> that you would be empowered to communicate the will of God for yourselves, your children, for others that was ordained by my Father from before the foundations of the earth. For surely, my child, it is this that Satan fears, that you might get saved, receive the Holy Spirit, and discover my Mysteries that were hidden from before the foundations of the earth. For Satan, my child, is not afraid of you because you are going to heaven. He shall not be there. For Satan is afraid of what you might do here on the earth as you go about like me, doing what I did and greater things even than I did, but going around for as I came to destroy the works of the devil, so you should be going and destroying the devil's ability to work in other people's lives. It is this that he could not comprehend. It is this that he did not know. It is this that had he known that you could tap into the mysteries that my father, that I, that God ordained before the foundations of the earth, He would never have crucified me. Okay, now just now, it was the gift of tongues I just interpreted, all right? Are you getting it? Now. The hidden wisdom of God. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Verse 8, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, had they known what? The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. In other words, had they known that you would discover these things, the mystery, the hidden wisdom, which was ordained before the ages for our glory. Had they known that, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Because now, by crucifying the Lord of glory, not only do you get saved, but you also receive the Holy Spirit. That's what he doesn't want you to have. He doesn't want you to tap into the mysteries 
the hidden mysteries from before the foundations of the earth for your life, for your city, for your nation, for your time. Now watch verse 9. Many, script, many preachers quote this out of context. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man. I'm going to say it again. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. The things which God has prepared for those who love him. What things is he talking about in context here that God has prepared for those who love him? Obviously, those who love him are the ones that are saved. Those things that are prepared were the mysteries, the secrets that Paul came to manifest that produced power in the lives of the people. These hidden mysteries which he tapped into by praying in other tongues. For he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto man but unto God, howbeit in the spirit he speaks mysteries. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now I'm being repetitious because I know it's a lot for you to take in. Now many, I've heard many preachers quote this. Kind of like suggesting at a funeral. I even heard them preach it now at the FBN. Great guy. Say this. That there are certain things that you will never know. And you'll only know it when you get to heaven. That's not what it means. Because the very next verse, they don't read it. What eye has not seen, what ear has not heard, what is unable to enter the heart of man, these things, these mysteries, these secrets, these plans, the will of God that he prepared before the foundations of the earth for those who love him. Verse 10. But God, but God, has revealed them to us by His Spirit. In other words, Paul is saying these things that I manifest to you in speech that produced a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and power that which your natural senses cannot comprehend, your natural sight, your natural hearing, your heart which speaks of your thoughts, your imagination, your will, your intellect, cannot comprehend, cannot even begin to imagine the things that God is able to do way above what you could even think, ask, or imagine because they are way above anything you could ever comprehend with your natural mind, your carnal mind, your natural sight, your natural healing. That's why Paul says, but God has revealed these things that are hidden from us, these secrets, these plans, these mysteries, these purposes, the will of God for your lives. That's what prophecy is all about. That which you cannot comprehend naturally, but God has revealed them to us by His Spirit, through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. What things is He talking about? These things that were hidden, these things that were prepared, these things that Satan didn't comprehend you would be able to access had he crucified the Messiah, these things of God. That's the essence of the prophetic inspired communication, divine expression, that all may prophesy. Oh, we're going to get into this stuff down the line. Now watch this. 
<coughs> excuse me, for verse 11. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Ay, 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 ay. Your spirit man knows these things. What man knows the things of a man? The word things, there's the context of the hidden mysteries, the preordained mysteries for your glory. Your spirit man knows these things. For what man knows the things in this context of a man? except the spirit of the man that is in him. The problem is in the heart. The problem is in the hearing. The problem is in the 2020 vision. The problem is not inside. It's on top. So your spirit man knows these things, but he has to get your soul your mind, your will, your intellect, your thoughts, your thinking process to come into line with that which is spirit. And many people resist that which is in your spirit, that which your spirit man knows. In Romans chapter number one, it says, there is no excuse for every in any man because what is known about God has already been put inside of them. Ecclesiastes says, Eternity is in the heart of every man inside his inwardmost parts. And your spirit man knows these things, but the soul, the intellect, the mind, the will, the emotions, they resist and suppress the spirit and believe the lie, which in turn affects the actions of them. So your spirit man, your spirit man is in a desperate conflict with your soul until eventually your soul accepts Jesus Christ and accepts the Holy Spirit. Then he begins to pray in the Spirit and slowly from your spirit to your soul you begin to discover these things. This is called revelation. For what man knows the things of the man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So your spirit man knows your things. God's spirit knows his things. And when your spirit and God's spirit become one, you will discover your things and God's things, which are all about you and your destiny for your glory. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Hallelujah. Remember, I taught you the Holy Spirit is a prophetic spirit. He is the Ruach of God, an ecstatic state of prophecy. He knows the things of God. Your spirit man knows the things of you. Together you will know both the things of God and the reason for why you were born. And that's why you've been given the Spirit of God. And that's why Satan does not comprehend what he did. He would never have crucified the Messiah because by crucifying Jesus Christ you get saved. And now you position yourself to receive the Holy Spirit. And by positioning yourself to... I'm trying not to preach. I'm supposed to be teaching. But I tell you something now... We have been given the Holy Spirit that can show us these things that the eye cannot see, the ear cannot hear, the heart cannot comprehend. In other words, the natural faculties, the natural mind can never grasp these things 
until your spirit and Holy Spirit become one and you begin to pray the mysteries of God in another tongue. Eventually, by the second, third hour, when I'm praying in the spirit, my mind automatically in the understanding knows what I'm praying in the spirit. That's when you become an inspired speaker. That's when you become operational by the spirit of prophecy. That's when you become the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's when you begin to edify and encourage. People that don't operate like this are always condemning. They operate under the ministry of condemnation. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 talks about the ministry of condemnation, which is as a result of knowing the letter only, which kills, not knowing the spirit, which gives life. And that life produces absolute liberty and freedom which is also known as the ministry of righteousness. You can read about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I don't have the time to get into it. My goodness, I'm just laying a foundation for where I want to go. Oh, man. I, I, I trust you getting it. You guys are getting it, right? Okay. So, now we have received, verse 12. I'm going to close with this and then we're going to move on. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. Why have we received the spirit who is from God? That we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. You got it? These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. All right, I better stop there because I got to move on. Got to move on. Okay. Now. So that's how the mysteries are uncovered. That's how you position yourself, enable your spirit to become compatible to God's speech. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? talking about divine communication now that produces divine expression now that produces power now but we have the mind of Christ your thinking remains unfruitful you begin to pray in the spirit you're in the word pray in the spirit in the word pray in the spirit in the word Suddenly, you have the mind of Christ. So when I get up to preach, I have the mind of Christ. When I look at people, I have the mind of Christ. And I speak the mind of Christ. Now, to flow effectively in communicating the received mysteries you need three things <coughs> excuse me you need three things you need wisdom 
which comes from above. You need revelation and illumination. These three things. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 15 to 23. Ephesians and Ephesians was the most well-taught church on the planet of its time and of its day. In fact, even today, if I compare what they were taught to what we are being taught, my goodness, that was a tall church. John the Apostle retired there after his banishment to the Isle of Patmos. Peter preached there. Uh, Paul preached there. Timothy preached there. Uh, Aquila and Priscilla preached there. I mean, my, listen, that was a tall church. I can assure you that it's, it's on a, I'm just a little hot here. I can assure you that the church hasn't even got half the stuff that, that the Ephesus church was taught. They haven't even got it. They haven't even got the basics yet. So in Ephesians chapter number one, I'll read it from verse 15. Paul the Apostle says, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, faith and love will set you up for wisdom, revelation and illumination. Okay. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom. Now, listen, a lot of you people, well, many of you, I'm sure, read Rebecca Brown's books. And in one of Rebecca Brown's books, the first book, there was a lot she said was right, but about 35% of what she said was the biggest lot of rubbish. She was disconnected from the church. She was her own little mission, and she began to listen to what the Satanists had to say to her as being gospel or being truth, and that's a big realm of deception. She fell for it. One of the things they taught Rebecca Brown was that when these preachers talk about the spirit of wisdom or the spirit of knowledge, they're talking demonic stuff. Wrong. Isaiah chapter number 11, verse number 2 says these words. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. It talks about the Spirit of Wisdom. Seven, we call it the seven flames of God, or the seven eyes of God, or the seven spirits of God. One Holy Spirit, sevenfold manifestation, which is the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of Wisdom, the Spirit of Counsel, the Spirit of Knowledge, the Spirit of Understanding, the Spirit of Might, and the Spirit of the Fear of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2 so that he might not go by the listening of his ears or the sight of his eyes. Because the carnal Christian is easily swayed by all these people that have a lot of waffle, waffle, yak, yak, bleep, bleep all the time and haven't got a cooking clue of what they're talking about. But when you have the seven flames of the one Holy Spirit burning bright in your life, which you get from the menorah in the holy place on the way into the holy of holies, you had the showbread and you had the menorah, which had the olive oil and then the fire of God, not even a big light or a light. Fire from God would fall on an altar and it was the job of the young priest to keep that fire perpetually burning and God's fire would light the olive oil, seven flames that would give you spiritual perception or spiritual sight. One of them is the spirit of wisdom. Just make a note of that, Dave. I need to get into that more when we talk about spiritual perception. And the Father of glory may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that's illumination, 
that you may know what is the hope of his calling. No one can teach you your calling. It has to be revealed to you. and You have to get understanding and you need wisdom from above. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Not new age, in the saints. I'll be teaching there. Okay, but let's leave that for now. The riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The word riches there is where we get the English word plurocrat, crat, plurocrat. Like Bill Gates is a plurocrat. He's got so much money, he'll never run out of it. There are riches that are being deposited inside of you, even in your spirit by God, that you cannot tap into unless you have wisdom, the spirit of wisdom, revelation, and illumination. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Okay, I'm going to stop there because of time. But let me just say this. You need these three dynamics in your life. Otherwise, you're going to make a mess. And let me explain to you why. The danger of not operating in these three dynamics when it comes to prophetic expression, which we all have in different realms, these three realms I've taught you. But every one of you has the power of the Holy Spirit and has a prophetic expression. All may prophesy. doesn't make you a prophet, but all may prophesy, which means inspired speaking, which then produces a manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which then should produce power. People, I sense the power of God all over the place. Now, to God be the glory. God be the glory. Let no man take the glory. Now I'm just going to give you very quickly the danger of just operating in a part of these three. A lot of Christians who pray get revelation, but they have no wisdom. And they have no ability to operate in divine expression. Now I feel led by the Holy Spirit to stop right there because I'm going to carry on in the next session when we're going to, my goodness, I just touched base here. When we move into the realm of visions and dreams because this all has to do with divine inspiration, divine communication, and because of time now, I'm also concerned they're going to cut the power off. Usually they do it at nine. So uh, I just want to, I feel led by the Holy Spirit to stop now. I've, I've thrown a lot out that you've got to chew on. But all of this is a precursor to being able to effectively operate in divine speech, in divine communication, in God's speech, however he may talk to you. Because if you don't, Understand what I've just shared with you in this session. You'll become a bad messenger at best. Or the mouthpiece of Satan at worst. In the next session, I will prove it to you. And then we'll get into visions, dreams, and God's speech, and so forth. But you've got to understand this session before we get into it. Now, I love you. I appreciate you all as I've been speaking, just as I've taught you now by the word of God. There's a manifestation of the, that's, that's why you sense the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And in that, there's the potential for demonstration of power. In other words, may the power of God come upon you right now. 
May he strengthen your mortal body by the power of his spirit. May he quicken your inner man, strengthen your inner man by the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. I pray for you. I really pray for you for the spirit of wisdom. Every single one of you within the sound of my voice. Do you know almost 30 years later when I pray, one of the things I always pray for is wisdom that comes from above because, oh, how I need his wisdom because I know how weak I am. I know how pathetic I am. We're going to get into that next week when we talk about these issues of revelation, visions, dreams, divine speech. I had to lay this foundation. Otherwise, it would be impossible for you guys to understand the next step, which is how to communicate effectively, how to be divine expression effectively as God communicates and speaks with you. I pray for revelation, the spirit of revelation. I pray for illumination. I pray above all else that you might prophesy, not academically, not bleat, bleat like so many goats, spooks I call them, talk the biggest load of rubbish, no anointing, no manifest presence of God, no real demonstration of power, goats. Be careful of them. All right. I'll take a few questions, just a few, because of time. And thank you for connecting with us in the presence of the Lord there's fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord there is healing in the presence of the Lord there is times of refreshing I pray right now every single one of you be refreshed right now and may God Grant you the desires of your hearts as you choose to delight yourself.